Welcome to Surgeon Syndicate. If you're paying attention, you know that you only make money when you work. It might be great money, but it's dependent on you. The information on this podcast will help you solve that. We interview experts and provide analysis into financial freedom through commercial real estate. Why? To help physicians like you thrive. Let's dive in. Welcome to Surgeon Syndicate. This is your host, Dr. Michael McManus. And we are here today with Zach Lamaster. Zach, welcome to the show. Michael, thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. All right. Zach is the founder and CEO of Rent to Retirement, a leading turnkey investment company. He's a licensed optometrist who now only practices on a volunteer basis. We always love people who have found a way to being work optional now on this show. He he started out in real estate investing while working as an optometrist and captain in the U.S. Air Force. This eventually allowed him to retire early from his career in medicine to be a professional investor by strategically investing in markets that maximize cash flow, appreciation, and equity. He went on to build a successful wholesaling, flipping, and management business working across multiple markets, which led to the foundation of rent to retirement. He's been considered an industry expert in the real estate market, has been published across many different forums, including Forbes, USA Today, Fox News, NBC, CBS, and Veterans Affairs, Think Realty, and Inc. 5000. He's passionate about educating others on the benefits of real estate, investing, and using real estate as a means to create the lifestyle each person desires for their family. Not only is he a seasoned real estate investor, a licensed broker, and he's invested in multiple asset classes from single family, multifamily, commercial, and new construction. So a wide array of things he's done before. All right, Zach. So tell us a little more. I like to hear a little bit more about you when we start. So uh, you know, started out, were you an optometrist before you joined the Air Force? Or was the Air Force kind of your path to uh, going through the educational process? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much again for having me on, Michael. I'm, I'm excited to talk to your audience. And I think hopefully having the healthcare background uh, will resonate well with many of your listeners. But yeah, I started my career path in, in healthcare as, as an optometrist. My wife is as well. We met in school and I was on scholarship for the Air Force. So I was on the HPSB scholarship. So I joined the Air Force after graduating optometry school and then practiced optometry there as a captain for about, about seven years and then moved out to Colorado where we, we opened private practices. But eventually retired from our career path, not because we disliked what we were doing. We're very passionate about eye care. And, and now we have some international humanitarian efforts where we establish permanent clinics in underserved areas nation or internationally. But real estate has allowed us to do that and really practice in a bit in a capacity that we like to and and impact more people's lives. But you know, real estate, I started investing in real estate my first year as a young captain in the Air Force when I started practicing optometry. I I think like many people do, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad once upon a time and just got the bug learning about money, how to think about money, how to think about investing. I used a VA loan. I bought my first house, which was a house hack, a duplex, lived in half, rented out the other half and thought, what a cool concept that I can buy an asset virtually with no money down and live for free, but also have an asset that's growing in value that I get tax benefits from. And so from there, I went out and every year, and this is about 15 years ago, since I bought that first duplex, I bought real estate every single year even when market change, interest rates, whatever, even when we lost money on deals, we consistently always bought deals. But there was a pivotal moment, Michael, where it really changed the trajectory of our lives and our investing in our business career path. And that's when we essentially learned how to invest outside of our local area. We started investing locally because that's what we knew and we felt comfortable with. But we learned how to identify markets throughout the country where there was better, better opportunity. There was more housing demand, rents were Rents and home prices were appreciating more. There's more upside potential, more affordability. And we were able to basically find properties that allowed us to expedite our investing goals, ultimately to retire us from our uh, professional career path. And that was really the birthplace of Rent to Retirement, which is the nation's leading turnkey investment company today, we're proud to say. And that was just, you know, a lot of friends, family, and colleagues that came and said, hey, we see what you're doing in real estate. That's interesting. We want to invest in real estate, but we don't want to be active landlords. Our local market's too expensive whatever the case is. And so really, rent to retirement was born out of helping people follow the same path that we did, which is identify markets throughout the country that offer the best investment opportunities, 
And then we, we sell those to our investors where we handle everything for them, for management, helping them with the lending, et cetera, et cetera. Fast forward to where we're at today, we're across 15 different markets, mainly Midwest and Southeast. We, we mainly focus on new construction, single family, multifamily, and we do anywhere from 800 to 1,000 doors annually. So it's, it's, it's been a long journey, but we love what real estate has allowed us to do. So there's several things I'd like to jump into a little bit more through your story there, but I'd, I'd like to go back back to the beginning, just because I've got a, a couple of brothers who are in the military and some good friends who used either they went to an academy or ROTC, or they used a, essentially like an ROTC scholarship as a healthcare scholarship to pay for their, their professional education. And it was something I looked at, but then I was like, oh, but you know, then with the military commitment, I'll make less money that I could in private practice. But I looked at all these docs who went the military route, and there seems to be a much more predictable route to professional stability, to financial stability. And be that you didn't have the loan debt or that predictable income or part of the, the network being in the military. Just tell me a little bit more about that path for you and, and how that worked out well and why you think that's a good route. And this is just people listening. If they've got, I've got kids who are just starting college and looking at different options to pay for education and why some of these military routes offers become a great option. Yeah, I think it really just depends on, on your goals and ultimately what you want to do. I mean, I had the opportunity to join a even even going into optometry school. Basically, my optometrist had offered me a job, you know, prior to even going to school. And I think that's actually fairly common to some degree, networking with people. But I decided to join the military. One, it was a little bit of a passion for me. I, I wanted to do that. But certainly the scholarship just made it that much more attractive. That wasn't easy to get. Uh, I actually applied for two years and, and didn't get it. And I got it in my oh. third year of optometry school. So they actually only paid for two years, but I still decided that it was worthwhile to do that. Just the simple fact of, yeah, the, the loan forgiveness or the uh, I will covering, you know, the the scholarship, not only paying your way through school, because I think they paid you like 2000 bucks a month to live, pay for all your books and, and education, but really the loan aspect, like I just wanted to, I, I didn't want to come out of school. I already had at least hundred K in, in student loan debt. I didn't want to compound that more and more over time. So that was a big decision for me. I certainly see, I mean, you could make more money in private practice, but it depends. It depends on, you know, your, your living situation. And that was a really a smart choice for me. And I, I don't regret it. Uh, and, and the Air Force definitely opened up a lot of other opportunities that I wasn't aware of at the time, like using the VA loan, you know, some of the long-term benefits that, that I have now. So I think it was essential for kickstarting my career path. Did there, in, in doing that as part of your investment network, have, it, have you brought old military connections along there too, not just people from your, your eye doctor network? ophthalmology network yeah they always say your your network is your net worth right and so it's uh every business is a people business maybe unless you're dealing with ai but <laughs> i mean every <laughs> every business is about networking with people and we definitely made some some close colleagues and business partners throughout our path in the military and right now i'm i feel very fortunate to have served the country and, and be a veteran because a lot of what we do just like our passion is in eye care my we, we have a strong passion around helping other military members. So we have a lot of veterans and, mil and active duty military members uh, that still invest with us. I mean, for example, uh, we have people that are deployed internationally and they're interested in investing in real estate. It's like, how do you do that if, if you're stationed or if you're moving around every two to four years? It becomes challenging. And so that's, that's part of the demographic that we serve is the people that regardless of where you live or what your occupation or investing experience is, having the ability to easily get started investing in real estate in a market that fits your goals where we handle everything for you. So we really like serving the military community and as, as well as a healthcare community, because I can wear, I've wore both those hats before. Uh -huh. I can empathize with those people running my own clinic as well. You know, being, being an active professional, it's like, you're already so busy, you know, in your, in just seeing your patients and possibly running your business. It's like, how do you, the last thing you want to do is create another job, right? Trying to invest in real estate. So we've kind of, we kind of carried that mindset into into our business today, and I feel fortunate to have those experiences. Now, did you find that during your time in the military, you had a more predictable schedule than maybe people in private practice, or is or is it pretty similar? 
No, I think you definitely have more time. I mean, part uh, in the military, you're not just not you're you're a captain before you're a healthcare professional before you're a doctor. And so there's many things that they have you doing. But I mean, my average day was six to eight patients a day, where that's probably double in private practice, you know, uh, certainly double. So I had a little bit more time. I think that also was beneficial for me to have more time to focus on other investment career paths and, and kind of look at investing. But I think the the lifestyle, I mean, as long as you're open to that and being, I mean, conscious that part of your day is not going to be healthcare, which might be a good break for some people. You know, I, I kind of enjoy doing those other things. And eventually, if you stay in the military, usually as you get into a, like a command or leadership position, you're taken out of healthcare completely. That's kind of the career path that you you go on. But uh, I kind of enjoyed that. So that is something to be conscious of. Okay. So it opens up that whole other opportunity. Like, well, I can do this for a while and then you're kind of automatically moving into a, a leadership management role. And then if you decide, no, I want to stay on the clinical role, is that where you have to kind of, you have to exit the military at that point? Or do they let you just stay in a clinical role if you wanted to? Yeah. To really advance your career, like when you get to the point of like Lieutenant Colonel, even major to some degree, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, like you're, you're probably overseeing clinics and other aspects of the hospital or the clinic that you're at, um, not, not the day to day. So, and th that's pretty, pretty much essential. I've seen very okay. few healthcare professionals that are still seeing patients on a regular basis as they advance their career path. And that probably when, when you had some of those other responsibilities versus just grinding through a huge clinic left you a little more mental bandwidth. Cause I know that was part of when I was trying to do something different is it would, there were times that it was hard to gather the inner the mental energy to actually focus on learning and doing something different versus just going to work every day yeah certainly that's that's true and the other side of the fence is you know the military is frustrating to some degree like i'll be the first one to say that right i'm very proud to have served but there's also a lot of like red tape and you know bureaucratic stuff you have to go through or sometimes like does this even make sense but it's all part of the job and and sometimes you don't know you're not always privy to the the bigger picture but you just got to do the job you're given so yeah i, I yeah. do think it allowed more time though i think the hospital industry has been catching up with the military and being frustrating <laughs> yeah <laughs> they're following the same path the bureaucratic <laughs> path yeah all right so then what was your decision then in, in exiting? You know, you said you, you left the military and went to open up some private practices, but you kind of already had your real estate stuff going on there. What was the, when you made the move beyond the military, what was that transition like and kind of what was motivating that part? I just always wanted to be a business owner. I like the idea of being my own boss, even from a young age. I, I like the idea of, of owning a business. I have seen other successful people and it seems like everyone pretty much like you can, you can earn a high income, right? Like even people, we have a lot of our investors that are earning seven figures a year working for someone else. And that, that's great, but you're still working for someone else. And so, and there is a ceiling on your income. You know, what I like about real estate investing and, and being a business owner and operator is often you're putting in more hours than someone who's employed, but there's also no ceiling. Like you can go out and create as much opportunities you have the ambition to do. Real estate is the nice adjunct to that because you, you can do that somewhat in a passive nature over time. But I always had an ambition to own businesses. And so we left, my wife and I, I was stationed in North Dakota. I did a short stint in Germany, but then we, we moved out to Colorado, which is where we still reside today. And we opened up, I worked actually as a small clinic part-time that we owned. And then I also work, fill in work at other private practices as well. And I only did that for probably three, maybe four years because our real estate portfolio at that time was I had like, by the time I left the Air Force, I had already seven figures of passive income from our rental properties, which didn't require a significant amount of my time. And so that was, that was nice. But as we wanted to be a little bit more as the business grew on the real estate side, I saw the exponential growth and I thought like I kind of scaled back my time in the clinic. I, I went from like five days a week to four to three to two to one. And eventually I was like, you know what, we we're, we far suppressed our income, real estate has just taken off. And we went into that full time with our active business rent to retirement as well, and then decided to keep our licensing and, and work on a, you know, more of a volunteer basis. My wife still fills in a couple days a month at a clinic because she wants to, but you know, real estate has allowed us to operate in that capacity. So you had some great things there that, that I mean, that piqued my interest. So the, by the time you left the military, you had already built a seven figure income. Was that that was gross or that was net? By the time we left the military, it was six, it was six figures of net cash flow 
you okay. know, we're probably around the three hundred thousand dollar range gross income. No, I take that back. It was mid two hundreds, and we were clearing maybe one hundred twenty, one hundred fifty. I'm thinking back years now of of passive income. We're at today. We own a large eight figure portfolio that does cash flow net over seven figures annually. As we've grown our portfolio, yep. Um, as I mentioned before, every year we buy more real estate. We go through ten thirty one exchanges. We maximize tax benefits, cost segregation studies, all the things. But that's that's where we've progressed to this to this point. Okay. So when you started in the military, you said you, you bought your first, bought a duplex on a VA loan, lived in half, rented the other half, and then you said you, you bought something every year. Was that like your plan, like on a schedule, you'd, you'd buy one, get it up and running, and then you start looking for the next one, and, or did you just happen to buy one every year? And this is, I'm, for me, I tend to, I, I'm not the best at setting this. Okay, we're going to do this on this timeline and walk through it, and it gets a little more sporadic. So when I talk to people had it, who say, "Yeah, I bought one every year," was that a plan? Like we're just gonna we're gonna build this thing systematically? Not not initially. I mean, quite frankly, and I, I hate to say this because I now I talk about like goal setting and a big thing that we coach our clients on is like set a goal in the next ninety days to six months, and don't even think about long term. It's good to have kind of high in the sky, big picture goals, but your mind. I mean, you need to have milestones along the way. You need to have those wins to allow you to get to the next goal. But when I started buying real estate early on, I mean, I just liked real estate. I just wanted to, I wanted to be savvy with my money. I wanted to invest it. I didn't know anything about stocks and I didn't necessarily want to or other forms of investing. So I just bought real estate, not kind of without a plan. Now, every every property I analyzed and I was like, all right, what's the cash flow on this? How can I be creative? You know, we ran out of money. Everyone runs out of money to put his down payments at some point in time. That's the slowest progression in the beginning. And so I had to be a little scrappy. I had to look at other ways, like bring in partners, raise private capital from people I needed to. Like I took out a HELOC on that first property, that duplex eventually, and reinvested that. I took a retirement account and rolled it over and invested with that. Used a line of credit so uh, and created financing methods. So I was a little scrappy in the beginning, but I, I didn't have like this plan to build this, this portfolio. And I, and I always tell this to people too, because real estate is a beautiful thing. It can fulfill whatever avenue that you want it to just because I'm sitting here saying I've had this huge portfolio and I left my career path like that doesn't mean that that's the right thing to do or the or the necessary thing to do for everyone right if you want to buy one house every 5 years or one house a year or whatever the case is for you like real estate can can fulfill that for you based on what you need, what your goals are but I didn't have a goal initially my my goal was like I earn x amount of dollars I just want to reinvest it right I like real estate I want to do more and then eventually we got to this point where it's like hey we we replace our expenses, you know, three or four thousand dollars a month in income. That's that's great. What's the next level? And then once we got to that point, I was like, hey, this is actually scalable. I, I started to focus more at that point about, all right, what's what's my next goal? I want to get a hundred K a month or a hundred K annually on in income and then five hundred. And then you know, it kept scaling over time. And it it actually, I'll say this too, it became easier as time progressed. You know, sometimes it's like you think about people that have these large portfolios and are wealthy, and it's like, how do you get there? Right. But they just, I think in a lot of cases, this is true for us, they stayed, stayed consistent, right? They just stayed consistent to doing something that worked over a period of time. And mm -hmm. I think that's been the, the key the key to growth. But I certainly did not start investing in real estate thinking we were going to be in any capacity where we're at today. Did you, when you, were, so were you self-managing when you started? And at what point did you, because these were single family or, or small multifamily, the, the management of those becomes a big thing. So tell us about how you went through you know, managing those in the beginning and how it transitioned into something else. I did start self-managing, I think as many people do, and I was not a great property manager. I thought <laughs> I was a really nice property manager, you know, because uh, I'm a people person, but I always gave people the benefit of the doubt and, you know, let them be late on rent. And then one month turned into six months late. You know, I just, I never personally evicted a single person when I was when I was a landlord, and that a lot of people took advantage of me. But I also wanted to, I, I don't know. I was just it was difficult for me to be a good property manager and adhere to rules. Once we started to invest out of state, it was pretty much a necessity to find good property management, which was that was also a big obstacle. I mean, we had to go through in some cases like ten bad ones to find a good one, and now we have a systematic approach and how we do that. But yeah, I always encourage people like managing property. Some people I think have the idea that. They want to do that for just the experience of it. And I, I kind of remind them like, you know, first of all, probably having good management is is they're going to manage the property better than you will to begin with, but it also allows you to focus your time on the bigger picture, which is like working your job, spending time with your family, scaling your portfolio. 
that is not the best utilization of your time. But once we invest, invest out of state and found how to vet and partner with good property management, we started applying that concept everywhere, even our local properties, and that allowed us to grow and scale. That's great because when I bought my first property, I wanted to self-manage it so that I could learn a little bit about property management. And I thought that would give me an advantage to finding good property managers and knowing what to talk to them about. But looking back, I think from what you just said, I think if I would have focused the amount of time I spent, especially because I couldn't find a maintenance guy. So I was doing my own maintenance, you know, instead of hiring a property manager who did all of it, instead of fixing broken railings, if I'd spent that time on how do I interview a good property manager? What mistakes are they making? I want them to correct and learning that side of the business, like how to manage your property manager instead of doing that work. Yeah, we, we do these things that you learn slowly along the way. School of hard knocks, you know, and that's, that's the way it is. And that's not wrong. That's not wrong to start that way. But I do think at some point, like, yeah, having good management in place and probably the sooner that you find them and employ them, I, I think you actually learn more from a business, putting your business hat on. If anyone's read the E-Myth or the Entrepreneurial Myth or E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber, like that's a great book about operating, like working on your business instead of in your business. And I, I just apply that concept to so much because I felt like I learned more from property managers that had good systems in place versus me just shooting from the hip, managing the property. You know what I mean? So That's a great, I wish I, I, wish I would have talked to you several years ago. I said, no, don't manage it. <laughs> don't even. Don't even start down that road. Because once you do that, yeah, you're right. Your mind, if you, if you start out from the mindset that I'm the CEO and I have to find good people to, to do these things under me, you don't get stuck in, in this process of feeling like these are things you have to do. They were ne- Your job was to find somebody to do them and never start doing them. I agree completely. And that was a really, that was a pivotal moment for us as well. It's like, all right, now we don't have to, you mean we don't have to think and deal with all the tenants about rent collection and dealing with these things. It was like, you know, just a, a little bit of a sigh of relief. Now you still need to manage your property manager, right? And you know, that's, that's still a business, but your time is just better utilized, not managing your own property. So I couldn't agree more. So you lose a little bit of cash flow paying the property manager, but did you find with that, that actually your portfolio grew faster because instead of worrying about that stuff, you were figuring out bigger problems that allowed you to grow. Yeah, I think that's a little bit of a misbelief on the on the cash flow side too. Just to point that out, that yes, you're paying a property manager, you know, whatever it is, eight to ten percent, uh, at least on you know uh, single family, small, uh, multi residential. But I mean, if they can keep the property leased and be better at rent collection and better on the maintenance side, like there's an argument to be made that you actually cash flow more with having management. But to your your second point, yeah, absolutely, having management in place where you just I had more time to focus on scaling the business, finding you know partners and and all the things that truly mattered. Because if you can take that time and apply it to acquiring an extra one to two properties a year, I mean that's huge. That's an additional stream of income that overall will allow you to cash flow more. In addition to that, wealth is built in real estate. Everyone not through cash flow. Cash flow is a nice byproduct, but you you buy in good areas with good teams and you let real estate do what it does over time which is appreciate and value, that's where you really build wealth in addition to using leverage strategically and maximizing the tax benefits. You know, We run an, an eight-figure business actively every single year and our goal is to buy enough real estate every year to offset all of our taxable income from all sources. And we do that, I mean, a lot of different tax strategies via 1031 exchanges and cost segregation and things like that. But like that is a big picture that you need to focus on to, to, to scale over time. And if you want to build wealth and financial independence and real estate, scalability is the name of the game. If you're mowing lawns and fixing toilets, you don't have time to focus on that stuff. Absolutely. That's a, all right. So you started moving out of, uh, look, you know, looking at properties out of state, and that's when you really transitioned out of, out of dealing with tenants and kind of growing your business. When you started to bring in investors, how did that go? Was that People coming to you, you reaching out to people, you know, a bit of both. I know that for a lot of people as they scale some becomes a very scary thing. You know, now I'm taking other people's money. How is that transition for you? For me, it was fairly easy. I, I did have, I mean, I was very conscious. I didn't want to lose a dollar of any investor's capital. And this is 
just to be clear, we're talking about my own personal investing, like our, our business, we don't raise capital from people, we help them buy their own individual assets, and we, you know, manage them for them. But with my personal portfolio, I found that I, I mean, I didn't raise any investor capital till like year three or four of, of my investing career path. So I had like a proven track record. And I was very intentional on where we were investing and kind of the outcome of the properties. And I was able to showcase that to investors. But quite frankly, investors came to me because I attended local REI meetups and, you know, and I, some different networks and things like this. But I, I basically just talked about the success that I was having and shared like property details and examples. And I found that there's a lot of people out there with money that they look to someone to help them to invest it. Now, whether that's being an active partner, I mean, we structure partners a lot of different ways. You know, people will just lend us capital. They actually partner with deals on us. You know what I mean? But I was able to showcase a track record. I felt confident about future performance of properties. Um, I was a good people person, but I just talked about what I was doing, right? And I talked about my success stories and people naturally approached me like, hey, we're interested to partner with you or like we have X amount of dollars, you know? So it's kind of interesting in that regard. I never really sought out capital. It always seemed to find me just by networking and talking about what I was doing. That's awesome. So a lot of doctors that I talk to, when, when you talk to them about real estate, and I, and I think some of this is because if you, you know, a lot of doctors, they went, to, they went to college and they were the guy who was always studying because they were trying to get into medical school and they went to medical school and it consumed all their time and then residency consumed all their time. Now they become a doctor and they have some money to invest, but they don't really know that many people outside of their doctor circle. They don't know much about any investing strategies because they've been so focused for so long. And you get used to this being treated as an expert all day because you are when you're doing your doctor job and stepping outside of that expert and being the, I don't know anything gets intimidating because you haven't really been in that role for a long time. So if somebody now they, and I guess this is kind of a lead into what you do also, if but even getting started, if somebody says, you know, I, I want to learn about real estate, I don't have much time, I want to invest in real estate, what would your be your recommendation for places to start learning to kind of move that that learning along to act to action as quickly as possible? I think the last point you made is is really important, and that's where the rubber meets the road of putting it into action because I'm a firm believer that like true learning comes from comes from doing in the sense of going through and actually acquiring assets and building a portfolio, not necessarily doing every aspect of the job like management, like we already kind of discussed, but uh, there's so many resources for people to start. I think the first thing you need to do is actually be honest with yourself about what capacity do you want real estate to fulfill? Uh, what is your time availability? What is your expertise level? What is your, I mean, your experience level and your, your capital position? Because you either have time, experience or money. Um, usually you don't have all three of those at the same time. And then also match that with the investing strategy. There's real estate is a beautiful thing because there's a thousand different ways you can invest, right? You can invest in a REIT, you can invest in a syndication and give capital to someone working and be a part of a larger project. You can invest in turnkey rentals like we do, where you know it's still on the passive scale, but you're owning real estate. You can you can self-manage, you can buy your own real estate, you can work on flips, you can wholesale. I mean, these are all things, but they all have different levels of risk involvement, money involvement, time is a big thing. And probably different experience levels that will allow you to be successful. So I would encourage everyone to be conscious about where you're at right now, what you want real estate to fulfill for you ultimately, and you know where your strengths and weaknesses are, and then find a strategy that is congruent with that. There's no shortage of online education, and there's a lot of gurus out there willing to you know tell you the, the one strategy that's the magic strategy, right? But Real estate, I mean, we, we invest in a lot of different asset classes. We do a lot of different strategies at this point. But I always go back to buy and hold rental real estate, you know, especially on the residential side. I think that is a very safe place to start because you're investing in a human necessity. You're investing in housing. There's a, a shortage of 7.2 million houses in the U.S. So, and you're, you're serving a human necessity. Housing is a need. Everyone will need a place to, to live. And so if you can re invest in residential real estate in a growing market i think that's a really safe bet i always encourage people like have a good foundation when you get started like don't don't shoot for the stars initially just get like a good foundation have a have a strong win and and don't get the shiny object syndrome where you're distracted by all the thousand different things you can invest decide on what your goals are your strategy and take action on it because that's where the learning happens and as you build a good foundation and you become a more successful investor that's where you can go out and do more of the creative things 
you know, maybe as you build a strong rental portfolio where you can cut back your hours in your normal occupation, maybe that will free up some hours where if you want to go and flip a property, you can do that. But maybe that's not the best starting point if you don't have a lot of time and experience, right? So uh, I know that's just my thoughts. That's great. So we're going to wrap up this show here. This has been, I, I love the story, your whole background and how you built this and you, you merged it with your military career. But in the second half of this interview, we're going to get into more of what Zach is doing now and how that makes it easy for busy professionals to get started investing in real estate without having to be an expert when they start. So thanks for joining us today and we'll see you back on Surgeon Syndicate. This has been an episode of Surgeon Syndicate. If you got value from this episode, you know other surgeons are hungry to become job optional and you can help them by sharing this content today. Schedule a call and we can make a plan. Looking forward to having you with me on the next episode.